just making sure. Yes, it's doing. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Ray Leonetti, and I am the Associate Director of Policy at Temple's Institute on Disabilities. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by Celia Feinstein. Celia was the Executive Director at the Institute on Disabilities for many, many years, and she now manages our state grants and contracts. We are very excited to be um, talking with her today as we interview, interview some of our Disability Pride heroes. Welcome, Celia. Thanks, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Always good to be with you. So for those people who may be listening and are not so familiar with the Institute on Disabilities, could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, happy to. So the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University is Pennsylvania's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities Education Research and Training. It's a long title. Um, we are one of 67 centers across the country that works on behalf of people with intellectual and other developmental disabilities. And um, we are sanctioned under the Developmental Disabilities Bill of Rights and Assistance Act. And as I said, we are one of 67 centers. Every state has at least one university center and obviously some states have several. Pennsylvania only has one. So we are a statewide program with offices um, in Philadelphia on Temple's main campus and in Western Pennsylvania in Wexford, which is just north of Pittsburgh. And basically um, when I say education, research and training, our major functions under the DD Act are to do university-based training, which is why we're in a university. Our mission is to train the next generation of professionals. Um, so, but not just traditional professionals like special educators, speech therapists, physical therapists. We train all students, um, anyone um, can come across our doors um, we have trained in the past students in the areas of media, arts, and culture, in film, in history, in political science, in law, um, of course, in social work and education, in all of the therapies. But our work in that regard is to provide training about disability to the next generation. We also have, uh, in, as part of our mission, community training and technical assistance, where we provide training to people with disabilities, families, providers, um, interested citizens about issues affecting people with disabilities and their families. Um, our third core function is research. Um, and we don't do sort of bench research, which is sort of what causes intellectual disability. We don't do that kind of research. We do what's called applied research. So we ask interesting questions and find out answers with the, with the input and really the direction of people with disabilities and families when that's appropriate. Um, so for example, we do a lot of work in the area of quality of life, um, in the area of assistive technology, in the area of criminal justice and sexuality, and certainly a lot of work in public policy. And then our fourth core function as a university center is dissemination. So we're not just meant to do research or provide training, but we're meant to educate the, both the disability community, but equally as important, the general community. So policymakers, 
uh, legislators, families and people with disabilities based on the information that we have and that we generate. So that's kind of what a university center is. We are also considered one part of the DD Act. Every state, in addition to having a university center, also has a protection and advocacy agency, which in Pennsylvania is Disability Rights Pennsylvania. And we have a Developmental Disabilities Council, which in Pennsylvania is the Pennsylvania DD Council. So that's who we are. That's a great summary, and I'm very excited to hear you talk about um, training the next generation of leaders, because I know that in Disability Pride, that is something that we talk a lot about, making sure that the torch is passed um, to the next group of disability advocates, so that's really great. Yeah, and if I could just add real quickly, one of the things that we're really well known for, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the country, is an area we call leadership development, where we are providing training to the next generation of leaders, not only at the university level, but also in community. So we're, we're also providing training to people with disabilities and families. And many of you may have, may have heard of our project called C2P2, Competence and Confidence Partners in Policymaking, which is a national model that provides training to people with disabilities and families. And we've been implementing that for well over 20 years in Pennsylvania. Well, maybe if this is new to some people and they're interested in policy, they will check out C2P2 and that would be great. So you've been working at the Institute for over 40 years, which is just amazing. But can you tell us how you um, got into this whole field of disability? So it's really interesting. Um, I always tell people that it seems to me that people get into this field in one of two ways. Either you're a person with a disability or a close family member of someone with a disability, or it's an accident. Um, I don't know that people intentionally get into this field if they don't have a family member or if they're not themselves a person. I think you get bit by the disability bug in a variety of ways. And I am guilty as charged. Um, I was bitten quite by accident. As a young doctoral student, I was in a research class um, with a colleague who worked at the then Developmental Disabilities Center, which is our preceding name. Um, and one day after class, he just asked me if I'd be interested in being a graduate assistant, a trainee. At, at the Developmental Disability Center. And I said, sure, sounds like a good thing to me. Never heard of it, don't know anything about it. And um, I started my work then at the DDC and very quickly just became so fascinated, interested, inquisitive. And um, that really spurred my passion for disability rights. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of an accident, but looking back now after 40 some odd years, I can't imagine having done anything different in life than what I've done for the past 40 years. So what kept your passion going over all those years? Because it's obvious you're passionate about the work. So I think I had the great fortune when I was hired to do this work, it was just at the time that the Pennhurst decision had been rendered. So Pennhurst is, for those of you who don't know, Pennhurst was a large institution in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where people with intellectual disabilities lived. And in 1974, a, a lawsuit was filed against the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, because of the care they provided or weren't providing at Pennhurst. 
And there was, at the time that the lawsuit was filed, the thought was that Pennhurst needed to be improved. But lo and behold, after the federal district court judge, Raymond Broderick, heard 13 weeks of testimony, he opined on December 23rd, 1977, that Pennhurst couldn't be better. Nothing that anyone could do could make Pennhurst better. And instead, and this is interesting legally, he never said that Pennhurst had to close, but what he did say in his, um, in his very well-known order of March 17th of 1978 was, Pennhurst has to be replaced. Pen, everybody who lives at Pennhurst needs to move into communities of their choosing. He talked about small community homes with individual plans, with supports that people needed to live in community. And so that just fueled my passion. I went to Pennhurst. I couldn't believe what I saw there, that people could really be kept in the conditions that the people living there were kept in. Um, people walking aimlessly around day rooms with no active, no activity whatsoever. Um, in various states of disrobement often. Um, there was often one staff person for 30 or 40 individuals, so no one got individual attention. Um, and, and it fueled my passion. I was like, this cannot go on. So at the time, the Institute had been awarded a federal grant to study the impacts of deinstitutionalization. So what happens to people when they leave these huge places like Pennhurst and move to the community? And the one question that Temple University asked is, are people better off? And they asked the question along many dimensions. Um, are people better off in terms of their own adaptive behavior and skills? Are they better off in terms of their own satisfaction, family satisfaction, community attitudes, and so on? So I had the great pleasure and joy and opportunity to work for seven years on the Pennhurst Longitudinal Study. And I'm happy to report that in every way we measured it, people were better off having left Pennhurst. So subsequent to the Pennhurst order, 23 states filed litigation that was patterned after Pennhurst with very similar results. Um, so Pennhurst was an incredible opportunity for us as researchers, but also as civil rights activists to see people with intellectual disabilities as very much a part of the civil rights movement. I think I hear uh, in what you're saying a bit of passion for the law to go with your passion for research and for people with disabilities. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It, it was an amazing vehicle in this case, Jamie. I think, you know, people had tried as they could to make Pennhurst better. There was um, an expose on Pennhurst in the late 60s that was done locally by Bill Baldini. And while things were, you know, there was a lot of attention afforded to Pennhurst, it never got the attention or the financial resources or the person resources that it needed to make it the place that they thought it should be. But instead, this very wise judge said, you know what, it just can't be better. There has to be something else in its place. And so he was a, he was a brave soul. He was an amazing jurist, I think. And he was able to see that people deserved more than what Pennhurst could ever have to offer. 
Well, it sounds like the disability community is very um, fortunate to have people like Judge Broderick uh, yeah. in their corner and also people like yourself. Yes. Oh, thanks, Jamie. I, I appreciate that. So you mentioned your research, and uh, I know you're an accomplished researcher, and I'm just wondering, as far as research goes, um, what's been one of your uh, greatest research accomplishments, do you think? I think, quite frankly, the move in our field to something called participatory action research, it sounds like a lot of big words and research words, but really, what it means is the people that are most affected by the research are the people who should be driving the research. So not research on or research about, but research with and research by people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I think the Institute in particular has moved in the direction where at every phase of the research we're considering, we include and are driven by the wishes of the people most affected. In this case, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities themselves. So in addition to the Institute having a consumer advisory committee, which we do, um, which is 50, at least 51% people with disabilities and close relatives, we engage people with disabilities as we start to, as we start to envision projects. So as we're thinking about things like independent monitoring for quality, as we're thinking about people moving out of Hamburg State Center, um, we, we want people with disabilities to drive that process, to help us think through what are the most important research questions we should be asking. And then to ensure that people with disabilities not only are parts of projects, but are employed by projects, um, work with us on designing survey instruments, if that's the way we're doing the research, um, work with us to analyze the data and to write it up and to disseminate the data. So we have many projects at the Institute that involve this kind of, this newer kind of participatory action research where the people most affected are the people driving the process. So I think that's been an incredible accomplishment at the Institute. Um, and just as an aside, in terms of Pennhurst, I think what we've been able to demonstrate and what we've, what we've been most excited about is there is no one for whom a place in the community is not possible. We have not yet come across the person as long as a person takes breath and even if um, they're assisted in taking that breath by technology, even, even a person who, at, with those support needs, anyone can live in the community with the appropriate supports. And that's, that's probably the greatest lesson of the Pennhurst study, because, you know, we heard a lot of naysaying, oh, you know, people that don't have a lot of support needs, they'll do fine. But what about people who have behavioral support needs? Or what about people with medical complexities? How will they live in the community? And we have been able to show without a doubt that each and every person, given the right supports, can thrive in the community. And I think that's been an incredible accomplishment over the last 40 years. You know, I'm glad your research bore that out because it doesn't surprise me a bit uh, that people with disabilities have faced naysayers and continue to face them sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, somehow we always seem to prove them wrong. Exactly. exactly. And, and I guess the other thing I've learned, too, just having spent as much time at Pennhurst as I have, is that people with disabilities are among the most resilient people I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, people who had had to live at Pennhurst all those years 
and left there and just had amazing lives in the community. Um, just the amount of resiliency expressed was just beyond belief to me. So that was pretty amazing too. So you've told us about C2P2 and you've told us a little bit about Pennhurst research. You know, are there any other projects at the Institute that you're really proud of or that you want to share something with us about? Wow. I mean, I think, I think there's, there are tons of things. Um, we had the great, the great fortune to be Pennsylvania's, to be the place that implements the Assistive Technology Act in Pennsylvania. Again, um, the AT Act, um, the AT Act was passed more than 20 years ago and every state has an Assistive Technology Act program and in 17 states, the Assistive Technology Act is implemented by the University Center for Excellence. So the Institute is one of 17 programs that implements the AT Act. And I think we've done a tremendous amount in the area of assistive technology. And we're very proud of our accomplishments in that area. Um, whether it's through our lending library where people can actually try out assistive technology before they buy it. Some assistive technology, as you know, is really expensive. And so people have the opportunity to borrow thanks to an additional grant from the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation at the state level. Um, people have the opportunity to try out their assistive technology before making a decision to purchase. Um, and I think, I think our AT Act program has done a lot for people. We implement the deaf blind program called I Can Connect. We have a free phones program for people who qualify for people who have hearing disabilities or disabilities that make use of a phone difficult. Um, people can get free adapted phones. Um, we provide tons of training and technical assistance, both to people with disabilities and families um, across the Commonwealth. And we have at least eight centers across the state that help us implement the AT Act program. So anywhere in the Commonwealth, you can find a place to go to get the services that the AT Act program provides. The AT Act program in Pennsylvania is now called Tech Owl, um, Tech for Technology. And it's technology for our whole lives. Um, but the Owl is also a play on um, the Temple Owl. Um, so I think, I think we're really proud of everything that, the, that Tech Owl has done over the past 20 something years. So that's another area. I think, um, I also think the Institute is very well known for our policy work, which Jamie, you lead. Um, and we have done just so much work in the policy arena, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level. Um, we educate our legislators. Um, we provide testimony when requested about specific areas. So for example, when the state announced they were going to close two more institutions for people with intellectual disabilities, we were given the opportunity to testify about what that closure would mean for people and why the closure of institutions made sense from, uh, again, from a civil rights perspective. People have the right to live where they want, with whom they want, in the communities of their choosing. Um, the, um, we've had several people testify on behalf of all different, um, different requests that are made of us, um, for whether it's for our research or our policy work. So I think, yeah, I think for sure that's, those are some areas where I think we've really excelled. 
It's it's uh, great of you to mention policy. I appreciate that because you know sometimes I think policy is not viewed as necessarily the sexy topic or the exciting topic. But um, you know one thing that this pandemic that we're in has shown is that um, policy can be really important. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, I agree, absolutely. And another area I should mention in terms of our personnel preparation. <clears throat> our university-based training work, um, we have a disability studies certificate program. So people can actually come to Temple who are seeking a degree. Um, at, right now it's at the graduate level. We're hoping ultimately to make it also available at the undergraduate level. But right now, if you are coming to Temple and doing a degree, for example, in school psychology, but you have an interest in concentrating in disability studies. We have a four course certificate program that's taught by some of our own staff and some staff external to the Institute, but that has become um, a very robust program. And we teach about disability rights and culture. We teach about disability and social policy. There's a research class and there's a field experience that students get to um, participate in. So that's been, I think, a really important aspect of the Institute too. And in addition to that, the Institute always has from 10 to 12 graduate assistants that work with us on our various grants and contracts. And they may be placed with us at the Institute or they, for example, we have as a placement site, the City of Philadelphia's Intellectual Disability Services, IDS. So they could be placed at IDS doing a variety of things, working with people at the city office. Um, so I think there, there is a tremendous amount um, of stuff going on at the Institute. We have roughly 39 to 40 full-time staff and about 10 to 12 graduate assistants that work with us. And we off, often have the good fortune of having a law student work with us as well. And the law student is typically assigned to Jamie to work with her on policy work, which is a really rich experience for a student. You know, it's wonderful to hear about all these things from you because you've just offered so many different opportunities for people who are listening to get involved with things that the Institute Absolutely. has to offer uh, or for others in the community who might be listening to this to um, come and check out the Institute. Absolutely. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention leadership and career studies. So we have one of 220 programs across the country that is a post-secondary education program for students with intellectual disabilities and autism. So we have a fully inclusive program at Temple for students with intellectual disabilities and autism. It's a four-year program. It's a non-matriculated program. So the students who come do not get a degree but they do get a certificate um, and they will have had lots of work experience, internship opportunities, and they take classes with typical Temple students. Um, and each of the students in our program also has access to a coach who works with them roughly 10 hours a week. It could be on social stuff like getting integrated into Temple's campus. It could be um, academics to help students um, who need some extra support in class, but it is one of the fully inclusive um, programs across the country providing college opportunities for young people with intellectual disabilities and autism. So we hope you'll check that out as well. So you didn't mention this, and I know I'm a little bit biased, but I also happen to know that the Institute has a really rich arts and culture aspect that a lot of other disability-related organizations don't have. So what can you tell us about that? 
Well, it's very exciting. Um, we have a unit within the Institute called Media Arts and Culture. And basically the unit looks to um, support the participation of people with disabilities in the arts, but also to recognize the incredible contribution of people with disabilities in the arts. And we had the great pleasure about, oh, I'm thinking six or seven years ago at this point, to actually develop a play. Um, and the Institute directed, produced a play called A Fierce Kind of Love that was based on interviews that we did with people with disabilities and families about the disability rights movement. And so it was, um, it was um, an incredible effort and we were really excited to be involved. Um, it was directed by an OB winning playwright, Suli Hollum, and directed by David Bradley, who directs lots of, um, lots of theater in the Philadelphia area and teaches at Arcadia University. Our cast was a mixed abilities cast. So half of the people in the cast were people with intellectual disabilities themselves, and half of the cast were actors without disabilities. It was an amazing play. We sold out 13 performances, and we were then asked to come back and be a part of um, the Philadelphia Fringe Festival last year, which was pretty exciting. So that gave another opportunity um, for audiences to see this incredible play. And the exciting thing for us is that about half of our audiences have been people who have nothing to do with the disability community. In fact, these, um, the people who came to see the play were avid theater goers mm -hmm. and wanted to see some really good theater and they got to see that. So we were pretty excited and we're hoping still to be able to reproduce that play in the Western part of Pennsylvania at least. Um, but in addition to that, our media arts and culture folks are up to a lot of things. Um, one of them is to tell the untold story about people living in institutions. And so we did do a pilot project funded by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. Um, we did a discovery project and now we're waiting to hear about an implementation project on just that. So we're hoping to be able to continue to tell the story of people who lived in institutions. And this was based on interviews done at the Sealands Grove Center in central Pennsylvania. In addition to that, our media arts and culture folks have been, in, have been involved in a very exciting glasses project um, where the National Theater of London has developed um, together with Epson glasses, have developed glasses for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, where the actual live text comes across these glasses, these smart caption glasses. Um, and it's pretty amazing. We also have been successful in securing grants to bring that technology to Pennsylvania so hopefully you'll be hearing about it. It's being pilot tested at People's Light and Theater in Chester County um, and will also be piloted in a few other theaters in the area. So our media arts and culture folks are very busy. Um, um, it's a very small unit of the Institute, but it's a very active unit. Um, and they have been very successful in securing support to bring the arts to to bring to bring the arts to, not only to people with disabilities, but to the general community around issues of interest to the disability community. So thanks, Jamie. I certainly didn't forget media arts and culture. It's one of my um, one of my I think one of our accomplishments during my tenure 
um, as the director of the Institute, we really shine the light on this area, and I'm happy that we did. Well, as you know, you know, one of my personal passions is the theater. So I'm hoping that when I go out to see some plays, whenever we can do that again, I see some of these smart caption glasses in use. That would be very exciting. Yes. So speaking of passions, I mean, you've told us a lot about uh, your passion for disability work and your passions at the Institute. When you're not busy with the Institute, which I'm guessing is probably never, um, but when, when you do have five or 10 minutes to yourself, what else are you passionate about, Celia? Oh, wow. Boy, that's hard. That's really hard. I love, I love to cook um, and I love to travel. Those are probably the two areas. And I'm very involved with family and friends, but I really am fascinated by the doors that travel opens. And I have to say, I'm always looking to learn and I don't leave my disability hat sort of to the side. I'm always interested to see how other countries, other cultures support people with disabilities and where we can learn to do it better. So I've had some great opportunities in my career. For example, um, I have had occasion to be in Israel several times. And this last time I went, I got to see um, a project called Equal in Uniform. And what it is, is it's an employment program for people with disabilities where people get to serve in the Israeli army because not, not everyone can serve in active duty, but there is in, in Israel, there's mandatory service. And so the thought is everyone should serve regardless of their need for support. Everyone can do something to contribute um, to the military. So I really enjoyed being able to see that and came back here and have been talking to some people about, hey, why can't our military employ the services of people with disabilities? There's lots of things other than combat that um, people do. And I'm married to a soldier myself, an officer. So, um, so that's really important to me. So I would say really travel. I love just seeing other places and being other places. I've had the great fortune to um, visit many, many countries um, and continents. And I was supposed to go to, I was supposed to go to Spain to walk from Spain to Portugal this year in May, but obviously um, the COVID virus had another idea. So I wasn't able to do that. And I love to cook for family and friends. And um, I, yeah, those would be my equal passions, I think. Well, thank you for sharing some of your personal passions with sure. us. And I, I hope you get to go to Spain and do that walk at some point. I hope so. I hope so. So, you know, as we start to wrap up here, you know, we're doing this interview as part of uh, Disability Pride Pennsylvania, which of course is a virtual event this year. And part of it is celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So if I can just ask you, what does Disability Pride mean to you, Celia? I mean, I think just, you know, as we say for everyone, be proud of who you are. And I think it's so important as we look at, you know, when, when you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, any of the movements, the women's rights movement, um, the Me Too movement, all of the movements, I think it's time it's time that people recognize that people with disability are proud of who they are. I mean, I always love when I read somewhere, if you had the chance to not have your disability, would you take that? I, I know I'm sure people ask you that. 
Jamie. Yeah. I mean, I hear it all the time and I'm like, why would you say that to anybody? I mean, it's like saying to me, if you could be born not Jewish or not a woman, would you do that? No, because being a woman and being Jewish is part of who I am as much as having a disability is who other people are. So I just think it's really making sure that people appreciate and understand that people with disabilities should be every bit as proud of who they are as any of the rest of us are. Well, as a person with a disability, I second that. <laughs> so just one more question, if I can. You know, it is the 30th anniversary of the ADA, and we've certainly come a long way in terms of disability rights since the signing of the ADA yeah. way back in 1990. Yeah. But what do you think the world is going to look like for people with disabilities maybe five years from now when we're celebrating the 35th anniversary or 10 years from now even? Well, I hope, I hope it's going to be, I, I hope the world is going to look much differently for all of us. And one of the things I think the unrecognized promise of the ADA has been the whole area of equal access um, in public accommodation. I mean, I hate that if I, if I want to go out to dinner with you, Jamie, and you have your scooter, I have to call the restaurant and say, you know, I'm, my friend is coming with me or you have to call, usually you call and say, <laughs> can I get in there? Um, I think there are too many places where um, people don't have access. Voting, I mean, voting is huge. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen all of the ways in which people with disabilities have been discriminated against in, the, in, in casting ballots which I really think we have a lot. Of, I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think we have a long way to go. And I hope five years from now, people will have more access, um, equal access to every public accommodation that we all enjoy. Well, I hope so too. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you for taking time to do this interview today. It's been really fun to talk with you and to hear some things that I do know about, but also to learn some new things. Oh, good. Well, thank you, Jamie, and I appreciate it, and, and power to the people. Thanks, Celia.